106 full-time, part-time, that represents a $3.4 million annual budget. And payroll. Yeah, payroll, I'm sorry. So we, it, it's incredible what we've all accomplished with our shoulder to the wheel. Uh, my name is Fred Campbell. I'm the chair of the board at the hospital, uh, Thompson Health System. I would just like to make sure that everyone recognizes that for the last four years, we haven't had a working doctor for our hospital. Dr. Campbell came over and did a shift on emergency rooms because there was an old contract for that. But other than that, we had uh, Dr. Trapp covered the mid-levels, but she didn't work in the hospital. We haven't had a doctor in that hospital that saw a patient for us for four years. And now we have Dr. Kenny. You're going to see an entirely different hospital now that we actually have a doctor. So, and I'd like to add, if we just, seem optimistic to you, we are optimistic about the future. We just want to get this business structured to the best advantage and move forward. With our, with our 32 licensed nursing home bed, best we can do is probably break even. And that's all we've done in the last 30 years. It's like we keep doing it over and over again. <laughs> Pretty soon it's going to figure out it's probably not, probably not going to be sustainable. And, and so maybe to give you a, a good picture here, so right now the nursing home has to pick up 84% of the cost of operating that facility. And Medicare only has about 16% of the facility that it picks up. And, and that depends on the Medicare utilization of the facility. So if we have 60% utilization, we get less money if we have from Medicare. And we have 80% utilization of this 16% of the building, we get a little more money. But we know it's going to be a sustainable dollar. And so when we do license and right size as a 25-bed critical access hospital, Medicare participates in the entire cost of that facility. It's like, well, that was a no-duh. How come you didn't do that soon? Well, keep in mind, four and a half, five years ago, we had a waiting list, and the market was much different then than it is now, and we have to make that adjustment and right size. What's your timeline for this? transition to this larger, either larger or different facility? The, uh, the facility will stay the same, the license, all, and, and the care will stay the same, only the license changes. Uh, in talking with the Department of Health on um, Friday, um, the process length of time uh, gets a little tangled when it goes to Denver. Um, and that can take anywhere from two months to four months from the day they get the paperwork. And it depends on every, all, all the paperwork being completed right, responded to, which we will stay on top of, obviously. But uh, uh, then you've got another bridge over time. Uh, we need to get to 18 to 20 beds. So... Uh, that will take some time. Uh, so, it, if from the time Denver approves, it's like days that the State Department will get back to us for the license change. We have to have an inspection. I don't anticipate any any needs that any construction needs or interior needs that would have to be because we've we've talked with the state about this over time and and they'll 
they see our facility as quickly adaptable to that without ex any real expense. So best time would be 90 days, outside would be six months to answer that. From when you apply? Yeah. So when, when do you anticipate doing that? Well, we, we really don't feel, and this is important, the board took this motion, but they tabled it because they need to know how the county commissioners feel about this and what direction they want to help us with. So, um, you know, there may be, I'm sure, a work party where you and I and we sit down and figure out the terms if, there is, if that's approved. And, and how we go forward. But we would do it as soon as there was uh, knowledge that we would be bridging the gap and right-sizing the facility. So as far as internal to set up these different bed arrangements, or you're, there must be some kind of updating you know, it's, that's needed. It's, no. okay, I'm standing here, no. and now I'm standing here. It's exactly the same uh, uh, care, the care doesn't change, it's just a different license on a piece of paper. But it's significant in minimizing our risk down the road with Medicare's involvement. And you know, it might help a little history, critical access hospitals didn't exist 35, 40 years ago. Max Bacchus in eastern Montana uh, Glasgow, of which I was a part of, sat down and said, you know, if we're going to have access to rural care and, and help the farmers and the egg and the business, we've got we've to construct a different way because these places won't be in business otherwise. So critical access hospitals, there's, I'm going to say roughly about 2,000 in the country. They're, they're all in, in U.S. Senators' backyards. Uh, it makes up one and a half percent of the total Medicare budget. We aren't going away. It's too valuable. Uh, so they're going to they're going to find a way to make sure that the risk is minimized. Uh, and so, direct answer to the question: It's a different sheet of paper on the on the wall. We'll, we have more Medicare involvement covering our cost. We will be roughly at 18 to 20, uh, quote, skilled nursing, nursing home beds with five to seven open for hospitalization. Yeah. Could dispel another phone call. This is not about a new hospital. We would like to see one, but we have to make money before we even start thinking about that. And it's not about an addition to this building. There may be some renovation later in the empty rooms to use use them for something else like rehab services. But this is not about an addition or a new hospital being built somewhere. Yeah. Yes, we're kind of running behind here now, so there's a few more comments and then we can... I, I do really appreciate now having a, a commissioner at our board meetings as an ex officio we think that's really, really important for good communication. The question was asked, how soon do you need this within the next 30 days? Uh, so we're at your beck and call for help on answering any questions that may be there. Uh, again, you've got a valuable, valuable commodity where patients are walking around in this community who would not be here today if we didn't have that emergency room department. $3.4 million in payroll is a big deal. And the, and, the, and the good care that our staff is rendering is incredible. Any other public comment? I have a question, Cass. Are you suggesting then that the ER, the place will close down if you don't get this loan? No, I'm not making any suggestion. What we've done is we, as good a crystal ball as we can have from the financial projections, we need an infusion to bridge the gap to right size the building. Okay, you just mentioned it twice about people walking around the community, so I just want to clarify. Well, the reason I mentioned that, I don't know, you can put a value on that. Right. And so the, the importance of uh, 
this facility and it moving and growing is incredible to this community and to people's lives. I guess I'll read so this letter just given to me here at the start of the meeting here. And, and so it's a, probably a comment on I'll read as fast as I can here. <coughs> it's uh, for some time, first a personal history of this hospital. While I lunch with some friends two years ago, Hopstead approached me and I told him I had some questions. He met with me and Tim Ravenel couldn't answer our questions, promised to do research. When I went back to his office at his, at his invitation and asked a couple of questions, he said he was going to give me more information. So I left and I waited out of Hopstead, stood in the office door and, and hollered. But Mrs. Campbell, we wanted to answer your questions. I didn't turn around or acknowledge his juvenile rudeness. Now they want a million dollar loan. Have they provided any audited financial statements? Have they ever repaid the county for the $400,000 loan from the bank that the county made the first two payments? Is it legal for the county to loan them money? They get a meal levy from the taxpayers. We gave another 200000 for an IGT transfer. The taxpayers of this county listed on the Montana Department of Commerce demographical information as the 34th poorest county in the state. Do you have any written business plans? Are there old copies of a written business plan? All these sounds to me like some pie in the sky Montana farmer. I need a loan to grow chilies. Oh well, that didn't work. Now I need a loan to grow cotton. The board of that hospital is not living in the real world and by indulging them with each of their harebrained ideas, the incompetence is just allowed to continue. Yes, I've been inundated with phone calls this morning and a town hall style meeting doesn't get it. About 18 months ago, there was a meeting at the school. Well, they painted such a rosy picture, they turned the corner and were turning a profit. Now it's all poor me. Let the voters decide if they're willing to loan this group one million dollars. Earl and Cheryl Campbell. Love to respond to that if it's uh, worth your time. Is there any other comments or anybody? I, I for one, would like to hear responses. There were a lot of questions put forward in that letter. I think it's important. Well, the meeting um, that we had was over a ton of financial misinformation. And what we asked is, we'd be happy to share the financial information, but if you're going to print it, we want approval. At that point, they walked out. As far as uh, harebrained ideas, when we started looking at recertifying the nursing home after the license was taken, there was waiting lists, we had national people look at this, we had local people look at this that really know nursing home hospital combinations and you know the waiting list and the occupancy levels you should give it a try was the answer and the community wanted it very badly and I think we were pretty bruised with it ever being closed down and the market did not have that uh, competition in it. So it wasn't a harebrained idea, but many other hospitals in the state and the country have converted to 25-bed nursing homes. They're 25-bed hospitals because instead of 16% Medicare reimbursing you, it's 100% of the facility and the staff, and that will minimize our risk. Those are two things I caught in there, but I, I don't know, uh, maybe there's, uh, I think we have the finest board of trustees in the state of Montana. No questions asked. They have taken tons and tons of time to go become educated. These two characters over here, it's unbelievable the time that they've spent and for them to be called some name is uh, deplorable. Um, uh, you all should be and can be extremely proud of what's happened in the last four years here. It's unbelievable. And if you go outside uh, and ask 
the professionals in healthcare, they are amazed. They are amazed at what you've accomplished. So we stand. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. We stand ready to, to work with you as quickly as possible to make this transition and bridge the gap. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess that I, I have about nine questions. Uh, when you're talking about this bridge, is is, is this money? Is this going to be? Is this bridge for payroll and operating expenses? Yes. There, there's no further expansion or purchase of of any other equipment that we need. Um, I think we can. I think we can work any additional equipment costs within some of our operations, so we wouldn't go to that. If you wanted it to, we could. It's. It, it's. We can. There's a lot of ways we can. Skin that cat, but we're not doing any brick and mortar addition. Okay. Uh, I guess the the other thing that I hear that I've heard a lot from it is uh, how are you going to pay this back? But I think more importantly, me is do we get a guarantee that we're the number one payment? That irregardless of who else you owe us money, you owe us up front first as far as your monthly payments go? I think the best way to answer that, do you get a guarantee? We have some obligations that are out there now uh, based on uh, collateralized equipment. Um, we've paid off in four and a half years, and this is really important, two and a half million dollars. We're asking for one million dollars over a five year period of time. Uh, You'll be at our, and you're welcome to come to any of our monthly meetings. We'll go through what our um, expense and revenues are. And yes, you'll be the first one paid. In fact, I, I, I think we've made all the payments on the 400000 except for the first year when we, were, when we opened up. It, it, was, it was literally breathtaking, exhausting to look at what we had in front of us. And the help of the $60,000 payment. Two. They actually made yeah. two. They made 2013 and 2014. We've made 15, 16, and there's one final payment due in October. Yeah. And we may, we may readjust that based on your approval to pay that off instead of 120000 to pay 60 this year, 60 next year. It's a... Um, so $17,000 a month payment, roughly. And uh, we have garnered that uh, for the last four years. So we, we can make that payment. But you'll have to be, you'll have to see the dollars and cents yourself. And, you know, the other part of this operational question is, um, what are we doing to retain and keep our, pay, our employees? And the, the board has always taken a position to maintain a market rate so we're as competitive as any other site uh, our size or even bigger because we do compete with other, other communities that are obviously bigger. And so uh, this upcoming year we did hold raises to 1%. Um, and uh, yet there, there is escalation because of the skill set that you need to have caring for the patient and, caught in, in wages. And that's a reality. We just have to keep, keep, uh, keep on top of that. So will, will you end up with administrative and medical reductions in staff, or will you stay staff pretty much the same? When you condense down uh, and change about, it'll be about 10 to 12 patients, through attrition, we'll readjust the existing staff or not replace staff that leave. And there's enough, there's probably a, anywhere from a 12 to 18 percent turnover <coughs> in healthcare general. So that pretty much <coughs> take care of itself. But it, we, we'll probably save roughly about 10,000 a month just in. Uh, realigning staff. Will you still be using traveling personnel? You know, we've chosen to 
not staff full-time people uh, uh, for vacations and we've got a lot of accumulated vacations built up it's probably our best benefit that we have so we will continue to, to use locums and there are several people who come from either Bozeman or Helena to uh, work with us uh, they represent a real skill levels and certification that probably couldn't have just in our facility so I think there will always be a need for a locum type staff in our size facility. Uh, just not going to get away with that. And actually, it's more fiscally imprudent to fulfill those positions with locums versus have somebody on staff that you would end up laying off or, or, or paying through the gaps. No, I think that's all. Okay. That's, that's well, thank only two you. questions. You had, you had seven more. <laughs> well, I can, well, some of them got rolled together. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you for your presentation. Well, I think we, had a we do have this on the agenda for um, discussion. Uh, at the least, it also does say decision. Um, is there anything this board wants to discuss today? No, I think we'll. We've got more questions to answer. And, we got Doc as a county attorney. And yeah. If there's public meetings or whatever, and we have people lined up that were scheduled here a half hour ago, so I think at this point we should close this in here. And if they want to come back again or, or however, but I'd request we'll, that we then postpone this till next week. That's plenty of time uh, to be able to accommodate the number of people who come here today on this issue. We do that. We've got people right now. I think most of the stuff was brought out. You wanted to anyway, so. Time is of the essence from our side because it just it just takes time to get notified. State working on it. We appreciate your time and effort. And you know, my phone number is two one eight two six zero seven two three one. That's my cell number. It's with me all the time. Uh, if you if you have a question, please call. We'd love to. Love to try and answer it for you, and uh, thank you for your time and hopeful understanding. It's a complex issue; it doesn't it just it's not an easy one. Uh, so appreciate it. Thank you, Kyle. Okay. Solid waste city of Helena. Options more efficiency for blood water solid waste. And step up to the okay. chairs right there. Move them forward if you want to. Or okay. Looks like you're pushing the county attorney away, so maybe you can take his spot. That's all right. Take my spot. Okay. Commissioners. I'd like to introduce Randall Camp. He's the Public Works Director for the City of Helena. Eric Griffin, Public Works Director for Lewis and Clark County. Um, as you know, Superintendent of Solid Waste for the City of Helena as well as Lewis and Clark County. Uh, over the last three to four months, um, I've uh, met with the Broadwater County Solid Waste Board and um, in our discussions, they are uh, uh, going to go out and seek an RFP for solid waste services for what they currently do, uh, what they currently have, I believe, with Valley View Landfill. Um, in our discussions, we've talked about uh, numerous things as far as uh, things to, to help Broadwater County uh, be more efficient in how they manage their solid waste. And uh, some of those discussions um, led to what if the city of Helena picked the waste up at Broadwater County Transfer Station and hauled it to the Lewis and Clark County landfill. And in those discussions with the uh, Broadwater County Solid Waste Manager, um, 
he had thought if, if that was one option that was presented that he might have time to identify and uh, deal with other areas of his operation would free up some, some time. With, with those options being discussed, um, for the City of Helena to be able to accommodate those needs, we would have to uh, apply for a um, hauling authority through the Public Service Commission, and which we currently have one for our current operation. We would just apply to extend that hauling privilege to haul waste from Broadwater County Transfer Station to the Lewis and Clark County Landfill. And in those uh, authorities, we designate routes and all that stuff is put forward. Um, so we're here today to ask uh, the County Commission, um, you know, if those, if this RFP goes out with options of that, uh, for your support by way of affidavit to the, through our uh, pursuit of that hauling authority through the PSC. So that's basically what we're here to discuss today. So I'm open to any questions or anything that uh, uh, you might have for us. You've been in contact with the Solid Waste Board and, and, and talking with us and everything. I, I have and uh, in, in, the, in our last meeting the uh, Solid Waste uh, board uh, discussed it, voted, and they approved uh, supporting our pursuit of, by way of uh, affidavit to the PSC. And with that affidavit, what, what, what they do is, it's just a quick one-page form that's uh, turned in with our application. The Public Service Commission um, mails out letters, they have a public hearing process, uh, for appeals or protests, and then with that support, somebody, if you support by way of affidavit, you would show up at the hearing to, uh, to make a stand on why you support uh, the City of Helena pursuing that hauling authority, and that justification would be, on your part, uh, opens you up for operational efficiencies as well as uh, um, opens you up to operational efficiencies as well as it, it uh, uh, opens the door for compet competitive bid for your waste services. Any more? Hmm? Oh, the application. The application fee, there is a fee, it will cost us $500 to submit an application fee. So with us doing that, uh, for us to be, we're here to be a good neighbor to help Broadwater County out. If we can help you guys be more efficient in any way, for us to, to, to put that fee up front, you know, we, we do want support from Broadwater County. Uh, otherwise, there's really no reason for us to apply for that hauling authority. <clears throat> any comments from any of the, the board? I just want to let you know that we will be entertaining the bids from uh, Logan uh, Landfill and and the, the one we're also using right now. So it's not just going to be Pete's proposal, but he just needs us to, to move forward. So, um, but we will be looking at bids. We're hoping to get it all accomplished by October. That helps you. Okay, so in other words, all this does is give you the, uh, the permission to work with the uh, Public Service Commission. Basically, your, your, your support by way of affidavit, we would continue with our application process. We would pay the fee, we would submit, there would be a public hearing, and uh, you know, on, upon their uh, denial or granting us that would provide you with another option as far as how you could you could seek a uh, request for a proposal on how you, you handle your waste if you're going to truck it yourself. If you don't want to truck it yourself, that opens the door for uh, us to be able to bring our semis down with our transfer trailers, load your waste, and truck it to our facility. So that's been sounding okay with the board and everything there. Any uh, questions from the 
Well, this, this actually, this doesn't guarantee you a contract. It only gives us the option of, of putting out a bid for contract that you would be allowed to bid for since you have the hauling permit. Yes, Commissioner, that's correct. <clears throat> so, Pete, um, the Solid Waste Board, every so years, uh, puts out an RFP, and, and like John said, area uh, landfill sites put in their bids. Mm -hmm. So why is it that you're coming to this commission now and not waiting to respond to the RFP, and if you do get the RFP, then pursuing the steps with the PSC and the monetary advancement from the county? Commissioner, um, to respond to that, uh, the RFP from the board would that would open Broadwater County up to submit a request for proposal for a variable options. It could be for them to continue to haul their own waste. It could be for somebody else to pick their waste up at that transfer station. For us to do that, we would need the authority in that hauling authority in advance. You can't put in. An RF, a response to an RFP without the authority, is that what you're saying? It wouldn't, uh, uh, we would not put, uh, we wouldn't put, it, we wouldn't respond to the request without knowing that we're already qualified to provide that service. Yeah, PSC could deny their permit. Is that something they do regularly? Uh, you know, the, it, uh, commissioner goes both ways. Right now, there, it's pretty common. You know, you have Missoula, you have Billings. They're receiving waste from all over. Um, you have a Great Falls landfill hauling Livingston waste from Livingston, trucking it right through Broadwater County, right all the way up to Great Falls. So in the waste industry, it's becoming a pretty common practice for people to seek different options of how they handle their waste. And a lot of them do it so they can become more efficient, reduce liabilities, um, uh, equipment replacement. A lot of people don't want to be in the hauling business. So it, there's more and more folks looking at different options, I should say. <clears throat> Go ahead. When I first got on the board many years ago, I'm the old guy in the board, uh, I looked at the route to get to their landfill. And with the with the upgrade of Canyon Ferry Road and, and Spokane Creek Road, you get to the roundabout, but you can't go north because that's restricted weight limit. So us as a board, we've always hauled the Tri County because cost wise and time wise, it would take a lot longer. You have to go clear in the Wiley Drive. They're requesting them to look at it. And our opinion is it, it takes them longer, you know, they're going to give us a bid on what if they're going to charge us per ton. So the route that they take really is, un, un, is not even of interest to us. So they can avoid that uh, part of the road that's got a weight limit for restriction on it. Another, another question for you, John, you mentioned the board voted to approve uh, doing what you could to assist Pete in getting the authority prior to the RFP, is that correct? Pretty much, yes. Okay. Any other comment? Any other public comment or anything? If, if I might, Go ahead. Chairman and Commissioners. Um, myself and Randall were just here to, today to, to show our support, we, uh, our partnership, the Lewis and Clark County and the City of Helena. We, um, we have good things going right now. We, uh, my solid hour, so Lewis and Clark County solid waste manager retired about 18 months ago and we tried a, uh, an interim partnership with the City of Helena to, uh, to have Pete manage both his solid waste operation and our so solid operation to uh, to be to be more efficient. And myself, I always hate you always hate to you know give something up, but I'm willing to try something you know to do it too. And we've just entered into a, 
a multi-year contract with, with the city of Helena and it really gives a good understanding for Pete to see for both ends to be able to manage and deal with both ends of it and we uh, we have a really good thing going right now and I think that we could from the county's perspective from the landfill's perspective and from the city's perspective we have a lot to offer you people and we can we can help out and I think um, government should stick together so we uh, we look forward to the possibility of being able to um, comment on your RFP, submit a bit on that's that's why we're here to show to show our support and our our partnerships today. So, thank you for your time. Any more um, questions or I'll you know, put a, a motion in effect so they can you know, go ahead with this. I um, I would be happy to, but I do think the money uh, should come not from the commission but from the solid waste. Department. No involved. They're putting up the money. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought you said you wanted that from the county. No, uh, the city of Helena will pay the fee for the application. That's we want to move forward with the application process. We just need to know that we have your support. Otherwise, there's no reason for us to move forward and, and put <coughs> up the fee up front. If Broadwater County supporting our pursuit of that hauling authority, you're telling us that uh, you're supporting us and you're opening the door for a competitive bid. Okay. Well, I would move that we go ahead and grant support, um, and plus with the urging of the Solid Waste Board, uh, for this endeavor. I'll second the motion. Okay, it's moved and second to support this. <coughs> with uh, Pete Anderson, I shouldn't say just Pete Anderson, the Wilson Clark and City of Helena solid waste. Um, any more discussion? Go ahead. Commissioners, uh, I, I will supply uh, <coughs> an affidavit form to the Broadwater County Solid Waste Board as well as the Commission. Uh, just like I said, it's a one, when we get our application filled out, we will get those affidavits to you so you guys can fill them out. Very painless process. It's only like four lines that have to be filled out. Short sweet to the point um, it has a justification description you would you would write a description down that uh, you're looking at supplying maybe additional solid waste deficiencies in your operation and uh, you're, you're you're going to reach out for hauling of your waste from your transfer station facility so it's very painless short brief but i'll make sure john gets one and would you like me to this who would you like me to give the yeah, uh, just send it to the commission. Okay. Fine, yeah. All right. Okay. No more discussion. We'll go to a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passed. All right. So we'll. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. This is a good education. <laughs> Appreciate it. You might. And did you get the. Information on this? Yes, I did. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, Reddysburg Historical Preservation discussion on junk vehicles and abandoned trailers. What's that? Can I pass these out? Sure. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Before you start, Deb, are you guys from DEQ? I'm from DEQ. Deb, do you have an extra one of these for her? I, if not, I'll give you mine and I'll look on the end of it. Thank you. Um, we have multiple here. I see from Raidersburg. I'm Deb Smith, secretary of RHPI. And um, I guess our, our comments, questions are... are um, our first was the dust on the road, which, thank you very much, because I see we have calcium on at least the main street. Another street that gets used quite a bit is the Mill Street. 
that goes up to the OHV park, which it would be really nice, and I don't know if you have any suggestions, but a larger OHV sign, and I don't know who we contact to get that, would be nice so that people turn, because they end up going all the way up, and when they get to the school, evidently, they turn around and come back, and then they look. You can see them looking, so it slows them down coming back, but they do go pretty fast going up. Which brings to the second thing is, is our speed limit on those roads. And I know, Laura, we had talked to you about, um, if we could have a sign that actually says how fast you are going. I've seen numerous signs around, not in Raidersburg, but numerous signs around. Even if it was for a week, so that even the locals go awfully fast. And our um, other one, and I don't know if this stayed up here or not, we went through here this morning, and that's an alleyway for a fire. You can't even see the other end of the alley, and, and I have other pictures there. I don't have them on your sheets, but I do have them there. So we have some fire safety issues, of which we are going to request to get on the fire board um, agenda to address it through them. But if we can get any help from you, that'd be awesome. And then we get to the junk vehicles. So you all have pictures of the properties in Raidersburg that are um, kind of eyesores. And I looked up, and in 2001, March 6, 2001, Broadwater Jefferson County pickup programs help junk junkers. So got a dead car, and it tells what Broadwater County or how Broadwater County is going to address that. And I'll leave it with Ann. And then I looked up um, state motor vehicle recycling and disposal program. What is a Montana junk vehicle? Well, unlicensed, don't run. Da -da -da -da. But it also says um, four or more junk vehicles requires you to have um, a shield from the vehicles from the public. You can move the vehicle to a location, such as a garage behind. You can have a fence, and it has to be six feet from the center line vertical to un un visual. So if you're on the center line, if you look out six feet, if there's multiple vehicles, you shouldn't be seeing them. And I'm not really sure that a 4x8 piece of plywood is an attractive fence. Um, I don't want to take a whole lot of time because we do have some other ones here. I just wanted to bring those to your um, attention. And some of our properties, uh, we have, and I didn't take a picture of it either, we have the church on the hill that is burnt and sitting there. And we continue to pick debris out of our yard that blows into our yard. And then we have some out-of-state owners. Um, we have some elderly owners who I believe their children. Um, I did look on the cadastral for some of the owners, and some of them are not who they um, who it who goes down there. But you'll see the one, and I'm not sure what's under the tarp, but I'm going to guess that those are tires like lots of tires, which has some of the adjoining neighbors a little bit nervous if that ever catches on fire. Um, and then just our, our beautiful semis on the road that have been there for 15 plus years. And you have a picture of that. So. Has anybody ever talked to them about getting those trailers off of there? We did. We did back in 2013, um, they were approached, and she's for it, and he's not. It may partially be because he doesn't have the, the strength, the manpower. I, I, don't, I don't know. I would be just guessing at this point. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. That RV across the road also blocking the intersection. Oh, yeah, and we came out, in fact, um, If you come here, there's our church. Mm -hmm. Not. So, 
So we hit the stop sign, which is right here. Okay, and we had to continue, and I should have brightened these, but I didn't. We had to continue to drive, so here's our vehicle, and we're seeing here, and we still can't see down the road. Mm -hmm. And we are practically out in the road, and we still can't see down the road. We're in the road, and now we can see. It's probably been sitting there 15 years at least. So, it's yeah, so, property. sorry, that's... Is that that camper you're talking about right here? It's in Lee and um, it's on the outside fence of Marilyn and Lee Barnett's, which I think is Lee or Marilyn and Keith, which is now Lee Barnett's property. That's so, where all, everything's grown over already. Yeah, actually, there's a lot of places in town uh, now that it's kind of came to the forefront of that are pretty dangerous. So, and you know, most of these people who. Um, have these junk properties are home 24-7. Well, I don't know that they're home 24-7, but they don't have jobs. So let's push that way. Um, the mud puddle in front of the school seems to be an issue, so if they can um, grade that road to, to go down into that field. And I also looked, and it's the state, that's a state highway where those semis are. And they have to be 33 feet from the center line off the road. They're not. And mailboxes, because I was while I was continuing to look, should be 8 to 12 inches at the edge of the pavement. So th those mailboxes, because of those semis, are up on the pavement. But they should be 8 to 12 inches off the pavement. So I think that's kind of what I had, and we'll make it kind of short, so any of these people who want to, okay. I'd like to address the same subject in support for Deb. I also um, want to put in the fact that our traffic in our town has increased, it has doubled this year, which makes an awful lot of difference for those residents on those roads and the visibility process and the driving process of stop signs and so on and so forth, and also the speed limit. Uh, it's incredible the amount of people that go through our town. And um, I think on one end we have Forest Service, and on the other end of where they're going we have BLM. And uh, so, and they know it, and it's open country, and we're the route. So I think some of these problems need to be addressed. I've lived there 46 years. I've seen a change, and it's changed drastically in the last two years. Uh, if we could get some of these problems, which I know you have throughout the county, so if there's going to be some restrictions and things <coughs> like this made uh, to control these issues, I think it should address the whole county, because we're not the only one that has problems. But we would like to see our resolve. Go ahead. I'm Jeffrey Dahl. I'm sorry I only have one copy of this, but uh, first of all, I've given you pictures of our home so that we can tell you that we care very much about our home. Our life savings are invested in it. Uh, we bought it as a bank repossession. It was derelict, and we spent a lot of money to fix it up and make it look nice. And we're really happy that a number of new neighbors have come in and also done the same thing. They're fixing up their homes, and Raidersburg's getting a lot nicer. I just have a couple of concerns that Deb has already echoed. But what I will show you, and I can just give you this, on this last page, my biggest concern is this pile of tires. Um, I think that's hazardous waste, and being a volunteer fireman for Raidersburg, I'm very worried that that pile of tires could burn the whole town down. Uh, we've, we've had experience with like the Falk Farms potato farm trying to put tires out, and you just cannot do it. You can see that pile of tires, there, there must be a hundred or more, are right there next to that chicken coop, chicken coops next to the Becker's garage. Their garage is right next to a number of outbuildings, so if that pile of tires goes on fire, 
Becker's house is going to go and several other houses are going to go. So as a fireman, I think this is a tremendous safety hazard, plus it's hazardous waste. Those tires are probably full of snakes and gophers and rats and mice and God knows what else is living in there. So that's my number one concern. And we, again, thank you very much for the calcium that was put on the road. The dust was getting horrible, and now it's nice again. So we really appreciate that. The speed of the cars is always going to be a problem. The sheriff has addressed that, and we see sometimes that that works. Other times the sheriff's not in sight. They go through town 50 miles an hour again. It just, you know, you could sit there all day and not see one speeder, and all of a sudden there'll be a dozen of them. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, there on Highway Eastman. And, you know, I talked to <coughs> Jim well, Mears yeah. quite a while ago, and he said to go to the sheriff, and it's been kind of round and about. Yeah. And well, unfortunately, it's, it, 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 you know, it's uh, it's like going through town, you know, through through towns and stuff. Is Broadway's a highway, uh, and so so is Front Street, and so the perspective of, of the roadway, as a roadway is defined, is 33 feet from the center of the highway. When it comes through town, it's not 33 feet through the highway, yeah. through from the center. Um, and otherwise, no one would be able to park on Broadway if that was the case, because it'd be parking in the roadway. So there's a different rule to apply to that. However, I had a discussion with Commissioner Delger, I believe last Thursday or Friday, in regards to this, and, and something has to be done. Um, it, it, it's people that are moving to Broward County are, are moving here. They want to have nice things. They want to have a nice community. And and, and unfortunately, we're, we're going to get put in a position where we're going to have to. And I wish Corey was here because we're going to have to tread lightly in the aspect of, of some of the things. It's, and and one of them is obviously anything that's within a, a person's property line is also defined as their curtilage. Uh, and, and, and so if you're going to enter that curtilage of that residence, uh, and sometimes it's anything encompassed in a fenced area, you have to have a search warrant to go in there and do that. So that causes a problem, especially when you start doing ordinances that, uh, in regards to junk tires or junk vehicles, that would be requiring one of my officers to be writing a search warrant to go into that property to then look at that vehicle to see if the plate is expired or if it, there's no motor in it. Um, the state law does not allow you to use binoculars to uh, do those things. They, there's a Supreme Court case of a, a marijuana grow that took it away uh, back in the early 2000s, I believe it was. So we can't do those things. So there's a complexity of that. But um, you know, Mike and I discussed is that I, I do think that we need an ordinance out there that says, you know, this is a violation where we can we actually have some teeth. Um, where we can write a, a county ordinance violation, we can give you a warning, let you get a chance to fix it. But in the same breath, if we have to come back in 72 hours because you haven't fixed it, then you get the ticket. And part of that ticket uh, would encompass, especially if it's a junk vehicle, um, it's your cost. Well, we're going to tow you. We'll, we'll go in and tow you, I guess, um, because the judge said so. Uh, and that gives the courts that ability as well. Um, as, as a sensing to have that vehicle towed, and it's at the owner's expense. I would think that if you got, I don't know if you're familiar with the tows around here, but uh, tows in Broward County cost you somewhere between three and five hundred dollars, where in Bozeman they're 150 an hour. So yeah, I think if you got your vehicle towed and you got a five hundred dollar bill, uh, chances are you're not going to do that twice. Um, and uh, and then it gives the courts the ability if they don't pay that fine on that tow bill, they can get them revoked and actually do something else with them. You know, there, it's. I wish Corey was in here so we could have have a legal opinion on it. But um, it's it's a slippery slope for for some of those things. And, and I I would <laughs> I would love to see uh, some work done up there. To be honest with you, uh, that that stretch going up. I wish we could make a bypass to the the dunes so people didn't have to go actually go into town. There is one through Keating Gulch, but uh, I think here you have. Bobby Hicks getting pretty upset if people are smoking through uh, her property and tearing it up as well. But, yeah. um, you know, uh, 
you know, it, something's going to happen. There's a lot of there's a lot of use there, especially in the Crow Creek Valley or Crow Creek Falls and campground and everything else. It, um, I don't know if an automated speed sign would benefit. Um, you know, I to be honest with you, I thought about putting a car out there with a mannequin in it just to scare people. Uh, it works in some places, but some of your some of your neighbors up in in there, I'm pretty sure would probably tow my car away and, and scrap it if I wrapped it up there long enough on a den. Um, and, but there, there, there are some issues up there, and we're trying really hard to, to get up there and enforce a lot of things. And we, we have, uh, I think we've made some pretty good progress. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's, it's out of the loop, it's out of the way, and, and uh, it, it does get difficult. And if they do see us, everybody runs and hides until we leave, and then they get back and we start doing their, their, their activities again. So I don't know. I think that have a, my suggestion to Commissioner Delger was that we have Corey look at some county ordinances on junk vehicles, junk, just junk overall. Um, and then we'd have to look at and reevaluate what the junk vehicle program is and if people are willing to participate in it. Uh, we haven't done it in quite a few years um, because the, the, I think part of it's the, the money that was in scrap vehicles has gone down so much that they're not even getting excited about it. So uh, lots, of, lots of conversation pieces. We just need a, a guy all the attorney to really give us some, some, some groundwork to, to work on, I think. So, if that helps. Well, the gal from DEQ on these tires, I don't know, was you involved in the other tires that are up the all several ways? No, I wasn't. Okay, but I, start, I was working on that quite a while ago, and I, I don't know, I guess there's still a problem there yet. But anyway, uh, uh, a bunch of tires like this on, a, on private property, what's is it, is it, if there's class of hazard material, could you step in then? Um, I believe so. You'd have to contact our enforcement division. That's not something the junk vehicle program deals in, or um, and you know the direct action isn't something that the solid waste program deals in. So it would you have to start with the enforcement, and they go through their process. Um, and I can get you guys a, some contact information for them. But I would start there. If that's that is a big hazard, and I think they'd want to on top of that. Are those tires still being dumped out there to mine? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Are they still getting dumped there? I think yeah. he's just moving them from one spot to the other over there at the mine. They're going in the dumpster too. Hmm. Yep. So. There was a yeah. bunch of them in the dumpster the other night. Mr. Chairman, may I approach please? Go ahead, please. I'll leave you this. That is what I printed out from the DEQ. Okay. And if you do Google Earth, this is their yard with all of their semis and their junk vehicles inside of it. Ooh. So yeah, the people with the semis it the is. Front. It is. So I guess I say there. if he doesn't have a license, that we have an issue. Mm -hmm. Is that? The, I'm is sure. That the, oh my God. So, don't tell him I showed you, but... <laughs> Is that all his back there, too? Yeah. 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 So, as, as far as DEQ is concerned in the Jet Vehicle Program, so, uh, what Deb brought forward as far as all the semis and the four vehicles, yeah. what's the process to go ahead and, so, and I've set that up? Them. I have a bunch of anybody else on them, but here's a free And thanks for coming. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, as she was saying, there is a definition for junk vehicles. Um, the vehicle has to meet all three of them. It has to be rec ruined, dismantled, inoperable, and unlicensed. So, if it doesn't meet one of those three, it's not a junk vehicle. And okay. we don't touch it. Um, all junk vehicles need to be shielded. We're, that if it's just one in a yard, it needs a nice car cover at the very least. Um, like she said, garages, etc. Anything over four um, needs to have a license as a commercial wrecking facility. So that's when, you know, if you have somebody who has a bunch of them, that's when we, you know, enforcement would step in and you know, try to get them to become licensed. It doesn't always work that easily. But um, so, and in terms of the vehicles themselves, we only deal with light vehicles, so it's 8,001 pounds and under. So the semis, we don't deal with. RVs, we don't deal with. Um, just kind of your commercial 